Welcome back, everyone. Laszlo Montgomery here, continuing on with this lovely China History Podcast introduction to the history of Chinese philosophy. As advertised last time, we're going to be looking at pre-Confucian philosophy during the Zhou Dynasty, the last of the three Bronze Age dynasties of ancient China. So when did China's philosophers make their first appearance? In the Chinese philosophy history timeline, nothing of great significance happened until the Zhou Dynasty started breaking up in the late 8th century BCE. The date for the demise of the Western Zhou is usually pegged at 770 to 771 BCE, when the ruling family was chased out of their capital near present-day Xi'an. They fled to Hunan province, where Luoyang is today, and thence began the Eastern or Latter Zhou Dynasty. And as far as Chinese classical philosophy goes, that's where everything really starts. No dynasty lasted longer than the Zhou, 1046 to 256 BCE, 790 years. The Western Zhou ran from 1046 to, as I said, 770 to 71 BCE, and it continued on in a somewhat degraded state during the Eastern Zhou until 256 BCE. The first half of the Eastern Zhou was called the Spring and Autumn Period, and the second half, well, that was a violent and blood-dripping time in Chinese history, and it's known as the Warring States Period. And during the final phase of the Warring States Period, there were seven states left standing from what were once Dozens and dozens during the Western Zhou. And by 221 BCE, there was only one, the Qin state, who had bested all the others. And they were led at the time by King Ying Zheng, much better known as the first emperor of China, Qin Shi Huang. Now we'll look at the Qin later on. For now, let's sit back, make ourselves comfortable as we look at the Zhou dynasty, former and latter and see how all the ingredients in China were just right for this explosion of philosophic thought. Trying to scrape together enough grains of pre-Confucian philosophy isn't an easy thing to do. Yeah, there's fragments of writings and inscriptions that have been uncovered, but most of the time we don't know for sure who said what, and even when we have something, we're not sure what its intended meaning is. The farthest back I was able to go was to the very genesis of the Zhou dynasty, to the days of the venerable King Wen and his two sons, the older King Wu and younger Zhou Gong, the Duke of Zhou. Like Yao, Shun, and Yu, this trinity from the founding years of the Zhou are held up by the Confucian Ru school of philosophers as the epitome of benevolence and virtue in a ruler. They did no wrong. This is all around 11th century BCE. King Wen lived from 1152 to 1056. Now, around that time lived a man named Yu Xiong, who posterity has referred to as Master Yu, or Yu Zi. We know of Yu Zi because some fragments of his writing appeared later on in history in a number of ancient classics and compendia, namely the Book of Han, and in the Qing Dynasty Qianlong Emperor's Encyclopedia to End All Encyclopedias, the Si Ku Qian Shu, just to name a couple. And not just Yu Zi, quite a few philosophers are only remembered in the fragments of their teachings that managed to be saved, commented on, and then mercifully inserted into some collection that kept the work alive. Now, we're only hearing this on the authority of China's greatest historian from ancient times, Sima Qian, but Yu Zi, who came from Jingzhou in Hubei, served as the Huo Shi for the first five Zhou kings. The Huo Shi was a ceremonial post at the royal court that involved anything having to do with fire. Back then, rituals carried a lot of weight, and much faith was placed in them, so his role was significant at the time. He was also referred to as a teacher and advisor to the ruling Ji clan, the founders of the uh, Zhou dynasty. They were all surnamed Ji. Yu Zi had previously been in the employ of the Shang rulers, but defected to the Ji's 
and serve them till his last days. And it was supposedly Yudzu who was the first to say, quote, He who renounces fame has no sorrow. End quote. Yudzu, it's not a household name in Chinese history, or even Chinese philosophy for that matter. His philosophy is hard to discern, no surprise there. He wrote about constant changes and the cycles of the universe and nature. His 22-chapter work, called the Yudzu, is slotted in the proto-Daoist category. Not exactly Daoism, but not anything else either. But he also touched on certain matters that would be discussed, argued, and debated for centuries after he left his earthly form. These concerned what made a ruler fit to rule, how to reward and punish, what made good politics. Nothing profound, but as I mentioned, scholars in the later Zhou and in the Han considered Yudz's words of sufficient enough import to keep his memory and scant content alive in the collected works they compiled for posterity. You know, it's a miracle we have as much history of Chinese philosophy as we do. More got lost than discovered, and we can only imagine how many Confuciuses didn't make it past the Zhou or the Han before their work, no matter how significant and profound in its day, was lost and their lives forgotten. This next person I wanted to mention, he's not really called a philosopher as much as he was a statesman. Now, I'm reluctant to not mention this man who was of such great importance in Chinese history that Confucius said of him, if it hadn't been for the gifts conferred to the Chinese people by Guan Chong, we'd all be a bunch of barbarians. This person he was referring to, Guan Chong, he lived from 720 to 645 BCE. Confucius was born 94 years after Guan Zhong's death, so he was an immediate beneficiary of Guan Zhong's many contributions to political order, laws, Chinese culture, and to philosophy as well. Guan Zhong is remembered for many things. Historically, he was the prime minister to Duke Huan of the state of Qi, Qi Huan Gong, the first of the hegemons. These hegemons were sort of like a primus inter pares for all feudal lords who swore fealty to the Zhou king. He spoke for them all and had the muscle power to give orders and maintain some semblance of order between all these future warring states. As the Duke of Zhou is held up as the ultimate example of the perfect regent, so Guan Zhong is equally esteemed as the perfect prime minister, or right hand to the ruler. With Guan Zhong at his side, Duke Huan's Qi state became the most powerful force in Zhou Dynasty China. Under Guan Zhong's steady guidance, China transitioned from the Bronze Age to the Iron Age. He put the Qi fiscal house in order and got the entire state firing on all cylinders militarily, culturally, and administratively. He helped to establish a legal code that would incorrectly put him in the same pot as the legalist philosophers Han Fei and Li Si, but he would have been more of a Confucianist than a legalist. Under Guan Zhong, the whole concept of the Chinese gentleman began to take shape. Not the British version of what constitutes a gent. This is the Chinese version of the gentleman, called a junzi, a man of noble character, of virtue, an ideal man whose character embodied the virtue of benevolence and whose acts were in accordance with the rights and with rightness. Guan Zhong's junzi didn't have to come from the moneyed or privileged class. Now, it's no big deal to hear that in our day, but back in the early 7th century BCE, that was a new and revolutionary idea. Being and acting in accordance with all that being a junzi meant became like a religion to the aristocracy in this emerging group. And as Jasper's axial age gathered speed, it was Guan Zhong who got the pitch ready in China for what was to follow with the likes of Lao Tzu, Confucius, and all of their disciples. During Guan Zhong's time, Qi State became the model 
for this new and sophisticated land of opportunity where people could come to and study under the patronage system of the ruling house. Chi had become the first of these Joe-era estates to attract scholars and to patronize them and, you know, as they said later on in history, created the environment where a hundred flowers could bloom and a hundred schools of thought might contend. The atmosphere for stimulating this kind of philosophical and intellectual discussion developed much quicker in the wake of Guangzhou. We'll see next time the preeminent intellectual institution in ancient China will get built in Qi State. And this is in today's northern Shandong province. Since antiquity, China has led the world in constructing the most intricate and elaborate timekeeping and astronomical devices. So I wanted to tell you about one luxury watch brand, Atelier Wen. They demonstrate high-quality Chinese design and craftsmanship in a single timepiece. And their watches celebrate Chinese culture and craftsmanship. Atelier Wen works with China's best designers and craftsmen of today to bring their collection of beautiful luxury watches proudly made in China. Atelier Wen's Perception Watch model draws from the exquisite geometries found in traditional Chinese architecture. Each dial is individually hand-cut by China's only Guoxie master craftsman, Cheng Yutsai, who engineered his rose engine machine himself. Due to its complexity, it takes a master craftsman around eight hours to cut one dial. And there were no guilloche machines in China before, and Master Chung had to figure out how to build one without access to any Western prototypes or drawings. Check out AtelierWen.com to view their collections and to learn more about Chinese watchmaking. You can mention the CHP at checkout to let them know we sent you. That's A-T-E-L-I-E-R-W-E-N dot com to see their impressive collections. The Atelier Wen Perception Watch will make a special gift for yourself or for someone passionate about fine, unique watches. Shipping can make or break a sale, so optimize how you ship your orders with ShipStation. They make it easy to automate and manage orders no matter how big your business grows. And they might even be able to help reduce shipping and warehouse costs. So optimize and keep up your momentum for growth with ShipStation. Sign up for your free 60-day trial now at ShipStation.com and use the code POD. That's ShipStation.com with the code POD. The history of Chinese philosophy really has its beginnings right when the political center broke down and the Zhou Dynasty kings lost their power. Once that gravitational force was lost, it became a long, hard slog lasting centuries where the more powerful devoured the less mighty. And as I said, what were once many dozens of these states and statelets eventually got whittled down to seven. And then these seven would beat the you-know-what out of each other for generations on end. It was a miserable time and swearing loyalty to many of these vanquished feudal lords who didn't make it to the final seven, who no longer had anyone to lord it over, were these hereditary warriors, or knights. They weren't your average army grunts. These were educated men. And these suddenly unemployed knights became known, in English anyway, as knights errant. Errant, in the old French, meant wandering. So a wandering knight like a Japanese ronin. In Mandarin, they were known as the xia shi, or just the shi class. And these educated soldier knights errant grew in numbers very quickly as more of them found themselves on their own due to the defeat of their lord. These Chinese knights errant, they became the heroes glorified in all the Jinyong wuxia novels. Historian Sima Qian put these guys on a pedestal. They were noble, totally selfless, ready to dive in and help the oppressed or peasant in distress. And as I said, they were educated, had studied the classics of their time, and were schooled in all the major ceremonies and rituals. There's been a million movies made about these heroes. These shi, or xia shi, along with other educated nobles, were the class that evolved 
into the Ru school of philosophers. Ru, R, U. Confucius belonged to this category. In English, we say Confucianism, but nobody uses that word in China. This school of thought that included Confucianism and others formed the Ru school. When you look up Ru in the dictionary, it just says that it means Confucianism. But in more ancient times, it meant a scholar or a learned person. The Shi, or scholar officials, made up the core base of the Ru class. You could consider them the lowest of those who made up the top layers of society. These former knights were the ones who worked that layer of middle and lower level civil bureaucrats in the government, your average Joe Dynasty civil servant. So in the century following all that Guan Chong had laid the groundwork for, while he was in the employ of Duke Huan of Qi, sprang these Ru philosophers, of which Confucius was just one of many. They became teachers when education became a path to social mobility. People of talent, now for the first time in China, had this potential yellow brick road to greener pastures, even if their relative wasn't a noble. Education became the fast track to the good time. Yeah, once the Western Joe ended... The good times began to appear farther and farther away in China's historical rearview mirror. Life became very bumpy and unpredictable. And that's when people began to start discussing and arguing. What was the best way to get out of this mess? Back then, they believed in a top-down approach and that it all began with the ruler. So amidst all the unpleasantness up and down the Yellow River Valley people began to have all these discussions. They discussed very weighty matters like what makes the best ruler? How shall we organize ourselves so that harmony in society is achieved? What was the best system of government? All pretty boring and simple stuff in our day. But back then, when all these ideas were fresh, new, and without precedent, it was a very big deal. Because of the ancient texts and oral histories passed on from earlier times, people knew there was a period in China when peace was enjoyed by everyone, and the kings were virtuous, the country prospered. Now it was just the opposite. It was every feudal lord for himself, and some serious debates started happening about where the Han people and their civilization should go from here. Into this state of affairs that Define the 6th century BCE in China, stepped all the names we know and love, Lao Tzu and Confucius most notably, and these two great thinkers, before they left this earth, gave posterity plenty to think about as far as how to deal with these tumultuous times in the Eastern Zhou, and that is the setup for next time. We're going to look at a few of these dozens and dozens of schools of thought that became known as the Bai Jia, or Hundred Schools. We'll examine the life and times of a few of these philosophers during the time of Confucius. And until that time, mes amis, this is Laszlo Montgomery signing off from the City of Night in the state of California and treating you to come back again next time for another exciting episode of the China History Podcast.